Hey, this is Troy Taylor with the Championship Football Coaches Clinic Podcast, sponsored by Reps Virtual Reality, First Down Playbook, Rack Coach, Tip of the Spear, the Top Hopper, Sports Workbook, Next Pick, and we are streaming on Sidelines Sports Network. Today we got Coach Dane Dameron from my alma mater, UVA Wise, and Coach, so good to have you on. It's been a while since... Since I've done one of these, Rush Propes was the last person we did, and you texted me, and I'm so glad you did, Coach. So for, for everybody out there that's watching or will watch, tell us a little bit about yourself, Coach. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad to be on. Um, I don't know if I can follow Coach Propes very well or not, but, <laughs> I'm, uh, but I'm glad to be on. Yeah, I've been a, I've been a wise for, I guess we're going, we're getting ready to be our eighth year. Uh, before that, I was at Eastern Kentucky University. Um, as the offensive coordinator there for five five of my seven seasons there, I was the offensive coordinator. Uh, after the 2015 season, they decided they didn't need our employment anymore, and uh, and so I was fortunate enough to get this job. But I've I've coached high school. I GA'd I GA'd in the in the mid 90s and coached high school in Florida. Uh, moved back to my home area in Northeast Kentucky and coached uh, high school football in Kentucky uh, back home, and then had the opportunity to start a a startup program at Kentucky Christian University in my hometown of Grayson, Kentucky. Um, that was uh, something I relished the opportunity to do because it was the campus that I grew up on. My father uh, started working there in 1972, was the basketball coach starting in 1978 and uh, off and on won 400 games, won four national championships. And so it was a, that was a good thing for, for me to have the chance to do. Uh, but, a lot of times it was kind of hard because a lot of the administration at that college was the same people that, that knew me as a little blonde headed boy running around campus. I was always going to be little Dano to a lot of those guys. And so it was hard for me to push and prod and do some of the things that I needed to do to, you know, to start football at, at a school where some people didn't really want football. Uh, you know, it was, it was enrollment driven and we were, uh, we were bringing in a different type of student that, uh, that they were used to having there. So it, it got increasingly hard and then had the opportunity to go to Eastern Kentucky and, and work for Dean Hood. Uh, Dean was the defensive back coach at Eastern Kentucky when I GA'd there in 95 and 96. So we had a really good relationship. And then when he got the job, he offered me a job his first year, I believe, which was uh, 08, but just didn't work out financially. It wasn't the right time, but in the 09 season, going into the 09 season, he offered me a job, and it was a it was too bit, too good of an opportunity for me and my family to pass up. See my wife popping her head in there. Yeah, it's it's good. You still got a wife, Coach. You must got a good one. Oh, she's the best. She she knew what she signed up for. Well, I don't know if she knew what she signed up for or not. You know, we were married. We were married for six or seven months. She wanted to have kids, so I got her a dog. Um, and then. <laughs> But she's, uh, you know, I've moved her all around. She's an educator. Uh, I joke with her all the time because she's married to an old, uh, to an old football coach. She's probably no, never going to get a retire because I've moved her around so much. And we've got retirement. I think we got retirement in half the states of the union. So um, huh. I don't know if we'll ever get a retire or not. Yeah. So before we started, you asked me about how I got started doing these podcasts. It's kind of funny. Because um, me and my son, we started this YouTube channel about over a year ago. We were just making videos and we went to a, a baseball card show today and we'd make videos about cards and we were just trying to get monetized. And in order to get monetized, you have to have original content. So like YouTube said we didn't have original content because we were just copying videos of NBA games and stuff and make a little like music videos. But uh I got my coaches to interview Billy Mills from Dinwiddie, and it was about an hour and 20 minutes. He he was very, very open about his offense. Mm -hmm. and he was a high school coach in Kentucky at one time, and uh, I got upset with my assistant coaches that were running the podcast at that time, and I, I basically fired them and because they complained that it was an hour and 20 minutes. And I had to write all the questions, and I had to write questions on a board for them. So I took this over, Coach, and we used to have the clinic that was a one-day clinic in person, but we didn't do it this year. So I said, hey, we're going to make a podcast out of it. And, Coach, it's just blown up. I mean, Jim McNally FaceTimes me a couple times a week. 
And it's just been such a blessing. I mean, to meet Rush Propes, um, George Smith, um, you know. Yeah, they don't get much better than George. My time in Florida, George and I has passed across several times and, and having the opportunity to recruit because when I was at Eastern, um, you know, I, I recruited Florida. And so I we got I got a long snapper from George down there at Aquinas and was was down there talking to him all the time and you know we always catch up at the convention every year yeah he's a he's hard to beat yeah I, I knew Mike Spencer um, that played for George and coached for George when I coached at Virginia Union so I mean I've had Mike Smith on I've had all kinds of people it's been so much fun just talking football so I haven't done one in a week or so and I'm excited about this so coach you went from high school to college. Um, you know, how was that transition? Did you always want to, to get back to college? You know, how did that all go? Uh, you know, I really, you know, GA in the 95 and 96, uh, you know, I had the, uh, after the 96 season, I had the, I had the opportunity, you know, to go to Ohio state and GA for John Cooper. Um, <laughs> I was in love. Uh, I wanted to get married a whole lot more than I wanted to go be a graduate assistant again. And, um, you know, I wanted, I wanted to make some money and, and, and start my life. Uh, I didn't, like I said, I didn't, I had a great GA experience for Roy Kidd, you know, coach Kidd at Eastern Kentucky is one of the winningest coaches in college football, you know, at any level. And I had a great experience for him because I was the wide receiver coach, you know, doing it at the one double a level at that time, there were, you know, Several GAs had the opportunity to coach, so I ran my own room. You didn't call it running your own room at the time, but yeah. I had the opportunity to run my own room, and I didn't have to do any film exchange. I had to cut the film, but back during that time, you know, in the Ohio Valley Conference, you got in your car and you drove and met the team halfway and traded the film. And, uh, you know, I didn't have to do any of that because I was meeting with kids and everything, so – even though it was going to be a step up to go to Ohio State and go from FCS to FBS or one double A to one A, what it you know what it was at that time, it, to me that was kind of you know taking a step back because I'd been doing a whole lot of grunt work and uh, you know that just didn't really appeal to me. But I say all that I just I was in love and I wanted to get married and uh, we we had a I had a job to to go to George Jenkins High School in Lakeland, Florida, and be the offensive coordinator there. You know at at age 25 and uh, you know that was something that I thought that I would be a great opportunity for me to do and so did that for two years and I was fortunate enough to get the head coaching job at Lake Gibson High School in Lakeland Florida and loved it uh, you know looking back on it you know I wish I never would have left you know because I, I think if we'd have stayed there we'd have we'd have multiple state championships uh, but you know it's just it's what we decided to do and and move back and uh, to northeastern Kentucky and I left all the athletes to go coach no athletes. I joke about that all the time, but you know I, I wasn't much of a classroom teacher. I did I did not want to teach, uh, and I don't know that I would have left high school to go to do, to go do college if it wasn't the opportunity, you know, to go start a program, you know, at Kentucky Christian, you know, that's, that's why I left where I was. I was at Boyd County high school and had a great job, had a great principal. Um, you know, we were, we were just okay. You know, we, we weren't great. We were just okay. We made the playoffs every year and we'd usually win a playoff game, but, um, the opportunity to go start a program and put my stamp on something was something in my hometown, you know, was something that, you know, that was too, at that time, was too good to pass up. Yeah, so I've had Nathan McPeak. Nathan worked for me. Man, he is a heck of a football coach. He's become a heck of a friend, Coach. So talk a little bit about him. I mean. Yeah, Nathan's Nathan's uncle, Gary, uh, his first coaching job was my senior year of high school at East Carter High School. Gary was straight out of Moorhead State. And uh, he uh, he became our offensive line coach. So, you know, he was five years older than me. Uh, he was, you know, we went undefeated my senior year. Uh, and I truly believe that Gary was one of the biggest reasons we did that. But uh, we struck up an immediate kinship and a friendship, and it, and it was great. And to this day, Gary is one of my dearest friends. But uh, he, uh, he, he left, you know, and then came back to East Carter. Uh, my, when I got out of college, and so for my first coaching job was for Gary, 
And, of course, it was Nate being his nephew. I remember little old fat Nate sitting on the – he'll get mad at me for saying that. I remember little old fat Nate sitting on the bench over there eating popcorn during the games, giving, giving him a hard time. But, uh, you know, then Nate had a great – had had the opportunity to play at Marshall. And then when he got out of, when he got out of college, uh, that's when I was at Boyd County. And I had, the, I had the chance to hire him. So him and Gary were my offensive line coaches at, at Boyd County. And I think it was for two years, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but – yeah, he's he's done he's done a really good job. Yeah, yeah. Hold on, Coach. I got Coach Billy Mills on here. I got Coach Dane Dameron here. I told him you coached high school ball in Kentucky. I told him you were heading up here to see me, Coach. It's Coach Billy Mills, Coach. And I, I, coach I, Mills, I, I got one of Coach Mills' Dinwiddie players on my team here at UVA Wise. Oh, well, you got a good one. Great job. Yeah, he's the best. So you gonna you just gonna give him my number, Billy? Hey, just get up with me tomorrow, man. You going to come up here tomorrow morning? I think he's got something going on. He's got to go to the church in the morning, going to speak at the church or something. And, uh, and I, then I could bring him in. All right. I'll, ask him. I'll text you. Okay, text me, Billy. Thank you, brother. You're the best. Man, Coach. Good Billy place to Mills. be on Sunday morning church. Yeah, Coach. B Billy Mills is the best. I mean, I, I've called him the best coach in Virginia. That guy, man, I mean, he is nonstop. I had the uh, the current coach at Pikeville, who used to be at Kentucky Christian. He's been on the podcast. He's good friends with Bill Best. Um, okay. Do you know him, Coach? I know Coach Phipps a little bit. Uh, just we've talked on the phone a couple times. Uh, so I wouldn't and, we're acquaintances. His uh, you know, his former defensive coordinator at Kentucky Christian is my defensive coordinator now at uh at UVA okay. Wise. So, you know, our 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 paths have crossed. There's the coach Buchanan. There's a bunch David, of good coaches yeah. in Kentucky. Yeah, David, David and Buchanan. I David and I coached against each other when he was uh when he was at Mason County, it was I was at Boyd County, we were in the same uh we were in the same district. Uh, had some real, had some really good games, real, really good battles. And this is Joey Farrell here, Coach. He went to uh, Clinch Valley. Totem Pole Nation keeps bringing in great guests. Coach, keep building the Highland Cavaliers. Moorhead State's where my dad played, spent a couple of years, and Whitley County, Kentucky. So Joey went to, to Clinch Valley College, UVA-wise, and he was excited that you're being on. Then what's that one school that wins all those state championships? I don't know if – Coach Buchanan wasn't the head coach. It was Coach Smith. That was in the yeah. That's Boyle, that's Boyle County. That's in Danville. Man, Boyle County. They, yeah, they're pretty good. They've uh, you know yeah. Chuck Smith started that. I mean, he didn't start the program, but he's the one that got it going. And you know the coaches after him have 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 carried on the tradition. You know, and of course that's the county school, and there in Danville is the city school. And Danville's won. They may have won as many state championships other than Trinity in the state of Kentucky, you know, so that's, that's central Kentucky there. That's good football. So I've had David Buchanan, Chuck Smith, Nathan McPeak, all from Kentucky, man. I'm telling you, I, I love those coaches in Kentucky at UVA wise coach. Like I'm just going to ask you about how, how do y'all recruit? Cause I mean, y'all are six hours from Richmond. Do you like y'all draw a circle around like wise, like a certain radius and do those States, that well, we're like starting to get, do they get you know, we're starting to do that because in, in the past, you know, we it wouldn't do us any good because, you know, being, you know, we're 45 minutes from Kingsport, but those guys would have to pay double the amount that, you know, an in-state kid was. And so we just would recruit the state of Virginia. Now we've opened that up a little bit. And so, you know, we've got what's called the ARC area, which is any county, what, excuse me, it's any state, you know, that is considered Appalachia. And as crazy as that Ooh. is, there, it, there's counties in Alabama. Yes, and there's in counties Georgia. In, uh, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, uh, you know. And so now we have really, you know, tried to draw, you know, a six-hour, six, seven-hour six, seven radius from us and really try to dive into that. We've done a really good job the last couple of years in the state of Georgia. Uh, we, we've been able to get some kids from, from the Birmingham area, too, Um and get some and get some kids from there. So that's really going to help us. I think in the next couple of years, you'll, you'll, we will really start seeing the, the fruits of that, you know, because it, it's taken a while to do that. 
I remember a couple of years ago, you came by Bird, and you would signed a couple of our guys, and, and we just started talking about you know, the transfer portal. And this was like probably three or four. This is before COVID, I think. And you know, what was your philosophy about the the transfer portal then? That you know, you, we talked about, and has it changed at all? You know, now. I, th- I mean, Division Two has has always had the transfer portal. It's yeah. just not being called the transfer portal because you you had a one time transfer exception as a, as a as a Division Two athlete, mm-hmm. and so what you couldn't, and then you could always get a drop down or something like that. But eight it's sem- just what was it, eight semesters or ten semesters. Ten you semesters? get you get you you get you know ten, ten semesters. Yeah. You used to get four. You used to get four years. You used to get five years to play four. But it was full time semesters, and you know it's. That's why I got a compliance officer. I just, I just, I just oh, yeah. send every kid to Coach Limley, and he tells me if they can play or not. But it's just, it's just the sheer number, you know. And it's the, it's the fact that you know that you have to, you know, just continually recruit your own roster. That's mm. to me, to me. What that's, does that mean? What does that mean, Coach? Well, I mean, you got. I mean, every year, you know, you just got to make sure that you know you. When the season's over, there's sometimes you've got to re-recruit your kids that you already got here and, you know, and just sit down and talk with them and, and you know, and see, you know, see what they're thinking, try to outlay the good versus the bad, why why you should stay, why do you think you should go, you know, and, and just try to weigh it out because the grass isn't greener on the other side always. Um, you know, and some people, some people need to transfer, you know, a lot of them need to stay. But, you know, that's just the world we live in. And so I think, Troy, it's gotten to the point now, you know, especially where we are, it's just it's about building a team every single year. You know, mm. to think that I'm going to recruit a freshman that's going to come and stay here for four years right now, that's hard. Now, that's the goal, and that's what we want to do because you come to UVA-wise, you're going to walk out of here with a degree from the University of Virginia. And, you know, for the kids from the Commonwealth of Virginia, that's a great selling point. Okay, that might not be a great selling point to a kid from Gwinnett, Georgia. You know, the degree is a good selling point, but they're, I mean, the yeah, university. They don't know about UVA. They don't know about the UVA degree, you know. And so you got you got to do everything you can to put the best team you can on the field for a year. And uh, and then once the season's over, you know, you, we have exit me. I have exit meetings with every one of my kids, and some of them are going to come in and tell me they're staying. Some of them are going to come in and tell me they're leaving. And – that, that's just part of it. And then, you know, are we going to hit the portal to try to find kids? Well, yeah, we got we got to do that. But we're still going to try to recruit high school kids and win with high school kids and just plug needs, you know, and fill needs with, you know, with some older kids. Because to me, that's, you know, to me, that's the, that's the best way for us to do it. Uh, because with the number of, you know, transfers that the FCS schools are taking from FBS schools, some of the kids that they may recruit it out of high school, they're not recruiting anymore, you know, because they'll sit there and tell them, you know, they'll, they'll throw out that you've got an offer, but you're not allowed to commit, but you've got an offer. Uh, and so those kids, I guess some of them will keep stringing those kids along. And so now a lot of really good division two schools are able to jump in and get on those kids. Yes. yes. And talk coach, talk a little bit about that committable offer. Like what, what does that mean? Well, to me, or not okay, committable offer, well, whatever to the me, difference and is, I, I mean. can, I can just, and I tell every one of our, I tell every one of our coaches this. I said, you guys can offer anybody you want, but if you offer them, you're if they want to commit, they, we take them. Period, point blank. Because when I asked Alicia to marry me in March, or actually the weekend Tiger Woods won his first Masters in 97. When I asked her yeah. to marry me, I didn't say, you can't say yes yet because i got two other girls over here on the hook. <laughs> and I'm going to wait and see what they want to do too. You know, that was, that was a simple yes or no question. And so, but I say now, if but if you offer the kid, okay, and something changes, you got to get out of it. Don't, don't tell me I got to call this guy and tell him we're not offering him. You know, that, that's not how it works because the only thing we have is our word. And when we offer a kid, it's they can commit right there on the spot. Okay, yeah. now, if, if if we offer a kid and he doesn't commit, okay, is that offer is still out there, but we're still going to go look. We're going to go out and look for other kids. But if that kid commits, 
We're going to ask them if it's solid. We're going to keep recruiting some other kids at that position, but we're not going to offer them because we got to commit from you. And uh, I think I think we have coaches have done a very bad job of keeping our word with people. And I think it's given a whole lot of us a bad name. And when you're on, when I'm on the recruiting trail and I offer a kid now and they ask me if it's committable, I just laugh. And I'm like, what? yes, it's, it, how's it not committable? Well, most of them just offer me that say they throw me an offer. So I'll, so I'll do this. Well, if I want you to come to camp, I'm going to ask you to come to camp. I don't have to offer you to get you to come to camp. You know, we offer you because we've done what we feel is a good job evaluation because I think we've got to trust our evaluation, you know, because I think, I think the whole camp process is huge. We've got to see kids run. We've got to see kids move. Okay. But to me, what camp does is just confirm, you know, there, there's no fun. I tell when we start one of our camps, the first thing I tell them is guys, there's not a single one of y'all are going to win a game today. Now you can lose a game today by doing something stupid and, DB and wide receiver one-on-one, throwing somebody to the ground or diving to try to make a catch. It's not what you're here for. You're here for to take one or two little things that we're going to give you in our 35 to 40 minutes of individual instruction, okay, because we're going to try to coach you a little bit, okay, and try to get you better because that's why you came here because the five foot 11, 225-pound offensive lineman probably understands that he's not going to play Division II football unless he's just a straight dog which we, we took one of those out of Richmond this past year, a kid from Hermitage. He's undersized, but he's oh he he will get on you and we're oh, very yeah. happy about we're very happy about getting that kid. Yeah, he went but, to Salem Middle. He went to yeah, a school that fed into L C Bird and all our guys knew him. He, he was. I think he's, he's gonna be a really kid. good yeah, I think he's gonna be a really good one. But you know, I just think that I think when we tell a kid, you know, you've got an offer, that's gotta mean something. You know, but it's it's got to mean something. If you can't commit right there on the spot, it's not an offer. And that, I mean, that's just to be point blank, it's a bold faced lie. It, it, explain to you know the some of the coaches that might high school coaches that might be listening to to this, or the parents or players. Like I know when I was at Virginia Union, you know, it wasn't until the kids came on campus. I think then coach would give them a dollar amount. So how does it work at UVA wise? And I mean, it's Division two, so you got to cut them up. Um, I mean, is it a dollar amount, Coach? And how does that work at UVA wise? Yeah, it's generally a dollar amount. I mean, I'm sure it's just like it was when you were at Union. Um, you know, I tell people all the time we don't have a single player on full scholarship at UVA wise. We got a whole lot of people not paying anything because yeah, we're going to package academic money. We're going to pay. We're going to take your pail. You know, and and th- there's you know if you're in state, there's there's some veg- there's there's money that comes with, you know, on the on the on the sliding scale of where your Pell Grant is, and if, if you're out of state, you know, we're going to give you some, we're going to give you a little bit of just a little bit of, of out of state money, you know, three or four thousand dollars, and we're just going to we're going to do everything we can to get that as close to zero as possible. You know, Division two football has thirty six fools. You know, we don't have that. We're under that. But we've got to do everything we can. You know, we're, we want to try to have 60 to 65 kids on scholarships, you know, and doing and doing the very best job that we can and um, try to recruit as good a student we can so they can get some academic money because, you know, it's my job to to put the best package together for a kid, you know, that we can. And so we lose kids because of the dollar amount. Kids that really want to come to UVA wise we lose them on the dollar amount or we beat schools on kids that maybe UVA wise was their first choice. But at the, at the end of the day, you know, what they're, what they're going to have to pay out of pocket or what they may have to take a loan, a little bit of a student loan to do, you know, is, is, is cheaper than what another school may be offering them. Yeah. So when, when a division three school offers a kid, like, what does that mean coach? Like, is it a roster spot? I mean, I know that, like, Farron. Well, I can't really speak for that choice because I've never coached Division Three. But to me, I mean, you know, to me, they're they're just offering you a spot on the team. Now there are some Division Three schools that can put some great package together. Private schools got funny money now. Oh yeah, you know, I used to see some of those deals from Farron. I told a kid, dude, you need to take that. Yeah, they they've we got institutional money. They can do whatever. 
you know, they can do whatever they want. That's, you know, where we are, that's that makes a little bit of tough sometimes when we're recruiting against a private school because we don't have the leeway to do some of that, you know, on a on a really marginal academic kid, you know. If you're going to get academic money at UVA wise if you've got a 3 0. If you're under a 3 0, you're probably not going to get some academic money. A private school may ha- kid may have a 2.7 and they still offer him eight grand, you know, just because they have the leeway to do that. They're not doing anything wrong. That's just how they're able to do that with their with their financial aid office. And so that's something that's something that we do fight, you know, with being in the Commonwealth, Virginia. There's a great Division three league here. Uh, the good thing about the state of Virginia, we've got ever we've got everything from, you know, UVA, you know, to Christopher Newport. You know, we've got all levels of college football. So there's a whole lot of, you know, there's a whole lot of opportunities for young men in the Commonwealth of Virginia to have the opportunity to go play college football. And, you know, we don't recruit against the division threes very often. You know, we may on some 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 walk ons, some preferred walk ons, if you will, that we're trying to that we may be trying to get. But we don't we don't run into them very often. How do you, as a Division Two head coach, like how's your staff retention been, and keeping guys or seeing guys go or replacing guys? You know, how does that all work? How's that been for you since you've been at Wise? Well. My offensive line coach Mike Compton is still with me. He, he yeah. was he was my original offensive line coach, and he's that's a good one. You know that was the 2016 season, so he's been with me from then. Uh, I think I'm on my f- fourth. I think I'm on my fourth defensive, my fifth defensive coordinator. Um, my third offensive coordinator, and then you know we've got part time guys that are going to turn over. You know all the time. And that's my job. You know, that that's my job is to, is to get those young guys. I need to try to pay my, my two coordinators and pay my offensive line coach as good as I can pay them. Okay. And then, you know, your receiver coach or your DB coach, hire the best young coaches you can that have a, that have a zeal and a passion to coach and try to get them there for one or two years. And then for me to do everything I can to help them move up the ladder, you know, cause this this where we are is not a destination coaching job. You know, it may be for me. You know, I'm at the I'm at the end of my run and I love where I, I love where I am. My family loves it here. I get a chance right now to coach my son. Mm. And um, you know, so my, my daughter graduated from UVA wise. She was on the golf team for four years. But you know, we have part time coaches where we pay them just a little bit of money and give them a place to stay and feed them in the cafeteria. And I tell them all the time, if you're here two seasons, you're you. If you come back for a third, you need to get, you know, mm-hmm. because that's not what this job is for. That's not what this job is for. Because you need you need to start, you need to start your journey. Now, what's really hurting us, you know, is all these off the field jobs that these FBS and FCS jobs have now. All these analysts and. And everything, because it used to be I offer a kid a thirty thousand dollar full time job. That's a great first job to come in and start. Well, now they can go be an FBS off the field analyst for forty five. Well, I'm not gonna get them. Now the advantage of them being here is they get a coach, they get a recruit. There, you're just you know you're a glorified GA, but money talks, Mm -hmm. and you know, and so it's harder for us to. and, And I lose coaches from here to go do that too. So it's a it's a it's a revolving door, but I mean, that's not just us, you know. That's not just us. But I'm I'm happy to have had my offensive line coach as long as I've had the D coordinator I have now. That'll be this will be his third season coming up, and I think he'll be here for a little bit. I mean, he wants to be a head coach, which you know, if you want to be a head coach, it's my job to try to help you be a head coach. But uh, I've got a good I've got a bunch of they keep me young. You know, they keep me young. You can't tell by the side of my hair here. But um, my coaches keep me young because I'm surrounded by a whole lot of them. Yes. So, like, at, when you were a young coach, you talked about the coach at Eastern Kentucky, but who were some of the coaches that took you under their wing and, you know, helped you? Your dad was a coach. I mean, your dad was a – you said your dad was a college basketball coach? He was at, a college basketball coach, yeah, at Kentucky at Christian. Kentucky Christian, Wow. 
So yeah, coach is in your genes. I mean, it's in your blood. Oh yeah, when you you know I graduated from Georgetown College um, in Kentucky. Um, I had the good fortune of being on the on the national championship, of being the quarterback on the national championship team, NAI team, mm-hmm. and uh, so I would say my first, you know, my high my high school basketball coach, uh, Coach Charles Baker. Uh, I love him. It, to, you know, to this day, I still keep in contact with him. Um, and coach, you know this. You know, as, as a high school coach, you're a father to a whole lot of young men. You know, because to me, that's the. I'll get on a tangent here, I guess. To me, that's, you know, that's that's the biggest breakdown we have right now is the fatherless home. And we we have so many of those young men, you know, that we have the chance to cross my path, I mean, to cross paths with. I didn't need that. You know, my dad, you know, I tell people all the time, I think my dad was the greatest human being ever to live except for Jesus Christ. Hmm. You know, that, that's, that's what I thought about my old man. But, uh, you know, but, but Coach Baker, um, I love him. He was he was so meaningful to me in my life and work ethic and demanding and everything. So he would he would be my first coach. Uh, my head coach Kevin Donnelly, um, who's now the head coach University of St. Francis up in Indiana, started that program. Was won three NAI national championships, and then my offensive coordinator was but was a man by the name of Red Fott, who was one of the innovators of the run and shoot. Uh, he and Mouse Davis uh, were two of the, you know, were the main run and shoot guys. And so my, uh, when I went to Georgetown College, we had the opportunity. I was a triple option quarterback that threw for 3,600 yards. Man. You know, we were, we were running the triple. We were running the speed option. We were running the double. We were running the belly option. And I was throwing 35 to 40 times a game. And uh, that was that was interesting stuff, but that's back when a whole lot of people were playing country cover three too. So <laughs> that, yeah, you know there there was there was defined dive uh, dive keep and pitch reads, and we were able to read that guy in the passing game. But Red Fott played a huge role in in me wanting to be a coach. And then when I got into coaching, you know, like I said, Coach McPeak gave me the opportunity, as, you know, straight out of high school. I mean, straight out of college, to coach quarterbacks, which, which was really fun. And then at Eastern Kentucky, Leon Hart uh, was the offensive coordinator my last year there. Um, he's, he's since retired. Uh, he he became the head coach at Ashland, Paul Blazer, in Ashland, Kentucky. And we coached against each other, which, which was really neat. That, that We were big rivals. But uh, he, he was he was a huge one. And then, you know, working for, working for Dean Hood at Eastern was huge for me. Uh, I think where Coach Hood was, is, and was so awesome was just understanding that, you know, we coach football. I tell people all the time, I'm not a football coach. I just coach football. You know, I'm a husband and I'm a father before I'm a coach. And, you know, Coach Hood had the, he had the perfect work, work and life balance where as a FCS coach, I was still allowed to be a dad. And, you know, I, there's no doubt my wife raised our two children, but uh, I had the opportunity to be home a whole lot more than a whole lot than a lot of college football coaches are, because Dean, you know, Coach Hood allowed me to do that and allowed us to do that, and so I'm forever grateful for him for what he's meant uh, to me as a coach, but more important to me as a role model, as as a coach and and, and as a friend. Have you always had? those priorities like that or when you were younger i mean because i can't say that i have i mean football is like i, I would mean, i mean i made the mistake of putting football f- ahead of other things i would like to think that as a as a husband and father i have my wife could probably vouch on that more than ever mm-hmm. more than me but i think I think I did, uh, and, I, and that goes back to Troy. I mean, I mean, that goes back to my father. My father was a full-time yeah. minister. My father taught a full load of history classes at Kentucky Christian and was the basketball coach, and he was gone a lot, but I never knew he wasn't home, and he, that's, that's, just, what's, that's just what's been ingrained in me. Have I been as home as much as I would have liked? You know, I, I've missed some things, but I had the opportunity to coach both of my children in, in upward basketball. Uh, I had the opportunity to take my daughter to her first tee golf events when she was a youngster. 
I had the opportunity to, you know, to help Derek's little league baseball teams was never the head coach, but had a chance to help coach, uh, and do that. And so anytime I've been a head coach you know, or even at Eastern, cause Dean let us do it at Eastern. Derek was riding the bus with me, you know, our wives and kids were, were free to go to every game. And so that's, that's always been the most important thing to me. It's never, it's never, football's never been the priority over that. Now there's times that into this day when, if we don't play as well as we do, I bring that home and that's not fair to them. But <laughs> I, would, I would think if, you know, if you had the opportunity to talk to my wife and, and talk to my children away from me and you ask them if I brought work home, they would tell you no, because I've never really brought work home. When I come home, I'm home. And uh, and like I said, that, that goes back to my dad. That's 100% goes back to my dad. Now, on Saturdays when we don't play good, I'm not in a great mood. But I'm not, you know, I'm, I don't watch film at home. I don't watch recruiting film at home. I make recruiting calls at home because you have to do that in the evening. But uh, when practice is over, we go home. I'm, I'm not staying in the office. Or, I mean, that film's going to be there at 6 in the morning or 7 in the morning. Uh, there's not a whole lot, you know, as my children have gotten older, there's not a whole lot of daddy time that needs to be done at 6 and 7 in the morning. Daddy mm. time was needed when Derek got home from football practice, when Hannah got home from school. That's when Delisha needed Dane. She didn't need Dane at six in the morning. You know, so I, I'll just start the days early. You know, we go to bed early. You know, we, I mean, I, it, if, if, the, if the Reds don't play good tonight and I'm mad about the Reds getting beat again tonight, you know, like I was last night, I'll, I'll go to bed at eight o'clock tonight just because I'm mad about the Reds. But, uh, but that, that's just that's just been me. And like I said, that that 100 percent goes back to my dad. And uh, I'm forever thankful for that. And, I, and like I said, I think my wife and my children would tell you the same thing. Uh, growing up, were you a Bengals fan, too, coach? I am a Bengals fan. Yeah. And Tried and true. Uh, I'm a Bengals fan and I'm a Reds fan. Uh, and I'm a University of Kentucky fan. Uh, those colors don't run. They'll never run. <laughs> Uh, being a Bengals fan is a tough life, uh, but uh, Joe Burrow has made things a whole lot better. Yeah. But um, I would say I'm probably a bigger Cincinnati Reds fan than anything. And the last 27 games have been spectacular. They've won 22 out of 27. Wow. So, so Who's that, their manager? David Bell. David Bell, and they've got some young prospects right now. That I mean, the future is as bright as it's been since, you know, the big red machine. But uh, wow, yeah, my son, my son has 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 chosen my life. You know, he's he's done what every son is supposed to do. He's rooted for his dad's teams. Mm -hmm. And uh, when the it was funny when the Bengals got beat by the Steelers. I think it was it was I think it was in 2014. They got beat by the Steelers in the playoffs when. When Vontez Burfett kind of went nuts there, Jeremy Hill fumbled. Bengals were running in to win the game and to ice the game, and Jeremy Hill fumbled. And uh, Vontez Burfett got those got those penalties, and Steelers came back and, uh, and mm -hmm. beat them. I went to bed that night, and Delisha woke up. Did they win? No, they didn't win. You know, so I slept on it and got up the next morning. And I'm sitting down there drinking my coffee, and Derek walks down there and goes, Dad, did we win? Oh, man. Sit down, son. <laughs> I said, son, you've um, you've done what every son is supposed to do. You you've rooted you're rooted for your dad's team, and I could not be more proud of you that. But I'm gonna give you one time opportunity here. Uh, you've done what you're supposed to do. I appreciate that, but you got a one time opportunity to make, to choose another NFL team. Uh, being with <laughs> life's hard. Two, but there's two caveats to this. Number one, whoever you choose, that's your team. There, we don't bandwagon. We don't flip flop. Whoever you choose, that's your team. And number two, it can't be the Steelers. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one day, like you asked me about this podcast, I was Facetiming Jim McNally and Anthony Munoz, and I had Vinny Serrato on the screen waiting for me. I mean. 
Anthony Munoz and Jim McNally. I mean, oh, that's the godfather of the, of the of mid zone right there, baby. Did you know and that probably the greatest you? of all time left tackle? Yeah, I mean, I couldn't believe it. And whenever they come on, coach, they're supposed to be coming on this podcast, Jim McNally and Anthony Munoz. And I said, whenever I get them, season one is over with. Like, season one of the championship football coaches clinic is over with. We're going to end it with Anthony Munoz and Jim McNally. Did you did, did I tell you I got Jim McNally on Twitter? Oh, I'm 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 following Coach McNally on Twitter now <laughs> because of you. Man, I, I watch him. I watch all his videos he posts, and you know, he that's faced really me today. That's really the only time, Coach, that as a Bengals fan, you get to good you get to see good things about the Bengals because generally, anytime you see a Bengals on Twitter or anything like that, it's somebody doing something against them. And so yeah. now I get to see Max Montoya and Blair Bush and all those and Joe Walters and all those guys that McNally had as the Bengals coach, you know, Bruce Kazerski, <laughs> him, him talking about, you know, the Bengals and, and all the stuff, yeah. that, you know, all the stuff that they did. You know, I, I can talk, I could talk Bengals with him for hours. Yeah. Well, coach, I'm going to, I'm going to text him. And I'm I'm gonna get him on a FaceTime call with you, Coach. Oh, that, that would be that would be fantastic. Oh. He might, and, but since since he lived across the river in Cincinnati, there, you know, he might be able to understand my Northeast Kentucky draw I got going on right here. I mean, this guy, I met him back in February, and he's invited me up to his mouse pack party. He has a whole week long party in Buffalo, New York, and he's invited me to it. And I'm going up there. I've never even been to Buffalo, Coach. I don't even know where Buffalo is on a map. I know it's near Canada. All it's right. up I know there. Where, I know Just where Wise go is. Go in the summer. <laughs> yeah, go we're going. In the summer. We're going, Coach. We're going on the 21st, I think, July That'll 21st. Be awesome. That'll and, be awesome. I mean, he FaceTimes me. He goes, Troy, did you see what I put on there today? And I'm like, Coach, I haven't been able to look at it yet today. But, I mean, it, it's just been such a pleasure. Yeah, he's. Yeah, I'm texting him to say, like Coach, I said, I'm a I, huge fan I of yours. I follow him now Bengals. because of you. Yeah, I'm going to text him. He's the head coach at UVA Wise. I'm going to text him that. Yeah, he he's a mess. I mean, like, you know, growing up a, a Bengals fan, I, I was almost like being a Redskin fan, other than we won three Super Bowls when I was a kid. So it's we, nothing like being a Bengals fan. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Coach McNally says here. No similarity. Heavy, he goes, these are my uh, – he goes, these are my four uh, Super Bowl loser rings. It's yeah, like, it's, you know, the first two Bengals. Rings, yeah. yeah, the first two Bengals and the, the Giants when they played the Ravens. And then it's, uh, you know, the Joe Burrow one. He was a consultant. But did you know that he got let go by the Bengals? It's a funny story, man. I'm going to let him tell you when I – but he, he said that the, that the daughter of Paul, of Mike Brown called him and said, we're going to have to, um, you know, not be able to pay you anymore. You know, whatever he's getting paid, 30000 50000 to be a consultant, you know, because we're going to have to sign Joe Burrow. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So what was it? Joe Burrow is going to get two hundred million, but they couldn't pay Coach McNally his fifty thousand. Or well, but if they kept him, they'd just be able to pay him one hundred and ninety nine million seven hundred seven hundred thousand or whatever. Yeah, they said we got twenty five coaches working for us, and we can't. And he he still had the iPad. So when he started the Twitter, did I tell you that uh-huh. he was he was tweeting out? You know, the he has the Bengals iPad, so right. he's tweeting out all the NFL stuff. I mean, you can buy the all twenty two. But right. he's tweeting out the Bengals practice film. And that's when he got a phone call from, you know, wh- whatever her name is, the daughter. Katie Blackman. Brown. Yeah. And she says, uh, tells him, uh, you know, we don't mind you putting out the videos, but do not put any more practice film. And he loves the Bengals. He is, I mean, that's his favorite team. I mean, oh, he, he's, he spent a lifetime with them. Yeah. He, he spent he a lifetime loved them. with them. He loved it. And it meant, it meant so much to me, Coach, when you texted me when I was having my manic episode about the camps and how, you know, I had a player in, you know, a Division One school, you know, text him to come to camp, and then he got hurt. And talk a little bit about the camps and how important those are 
for y'all in evaluation? You already have a little bit, but I mean, I mean, what what's your idea on camps? And you know, um, you know, saying basically telling kids they got to come to camp, even if they're not interested, or just another way to tell a kid no. You know, what what can we do better as coaches about that? Well, I mean, the, the first thing it just all goes back to honesty, and I, mean, uh, I think a lot. I think camps you know our camps the other division two camps and uh of schools in the state of virginia or the division three camps are really good because it gives it gives kids a chance you know to be coached by college coaches uh and not only that most high school kids that go play college football are going to come to us in the division three schools you know so a, it lets it lets them see the reality. I'm either good enough right now. I can be good enough if I'll work just a little bit more, or I understand that my senior year of high school or whatever it's going to be is going to be my last go around in football. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, when I when I conclude every one of our camps, I address that. You know probably 80% of you guys here are not going to play college football. That's just a fact. But that doesn't mean that you don't try to be the best that you can be. That doesn't mean that you don't try to be the best teammate that you can be. Because if I could go back, Troy, and play one more football game, one more, I'd go back to 1989 and play for the East Carter Raiders. That's what I would go back and do because – the guys that you play high school football with generally, especially when you were and I were in high school, mm -hmm. you played with those guys from the time you were in the fifth or sixth grade till you graduate. And so those were your guys. You grew up with them. Those are your boys. Those are the ones that you never talk to now. But if I drove back to Grayson and saw Kurt Bear right now, who I've not seen in 15 years, Kurt and I would hug each other and it would be 1989 all over because that's what it is. And so I think that camps have the opportunity to set a realistic expectation on a kid for a younger guy. It lets them see what I need to do. Okay. Now the difference in our camp and, you know, in a big time FBS camp, we're not going to have 400 kids there, you know, so, the kid that never has a chance, that's not going to ever have a chance to play FBS football, them going to a camp that has 400 kids there, well, they are, they're just writing the check. And it's hard. They're not being seen. Okay. Now you come to UVA Wise's camp, you know, we've got 75 to 80 kids max. You're playing both sides of the ball. So you're getting coached by both sides of the ball. And so we've got the true opportunity to evaluate a kid and let them know. I've had kids come up to me and coach, you think I can play for you? It's going to be tough, buddy. It's yeah. going to be tough, you know, and I, and I think that, I think that that's my job. You're a really good high school football player and that's great. And there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. Okay. And so they're a huge recruiting tool for us because we go out and do our satellite camps in the month of May. And, you know, we've, we've, we've offered a whole lot of kids. OK, and some of those kids, we may never, you know, we may never have a chance to get on our campus if they don't have a chance to meet us as coaches first. And so that's what, you know, that's what's really hugely important for us. And so at our level, I think they're huge. I think they're huge. And uh, we've got to. But the thing is, is, you know, like you and I have talked, we've got to be honest to the kid and and let them know uh we're not offering you to come to camp and we're not charging an arm and a leg for you to come to camp, you know, but it, it helps us. It helps us be able to get out and, and, and recruit and do what we need to do. Yeah. With this podcast coach, we want to do three things. It's the same thing that we want to do with our football program. And that's like, first we want to change lives Two, We want to uh, help get others to the next level. And then the third thing is we want to help build champions for life. So for the coaches out there that are watching, you know, what, what can you tell them? Maybe the, we'll start with the young coaches, you know, the guys that, that have coached for less than 10 years, five years or less, 
Like, what, what, what can you say to those young guys, Coach, to, to help them? Uh, well, be a sponge. Um, don't think you have all the answers because you don't. <laughs> now, you do have some answers. There, there's no question, you know. I have young guys come in all the time and say, Coach, what do you think about this? I like that. That's better. You know, uh, don't be don't be scared to present ideas, but understand 95% of them are going to get shot down, you know, especially when you're really, really new in the business. But don't be scared. Don't be scared to, you know, to try to give input. But when you do, just file it, understand it, you know, and learn from it because, you know, that that's going to happen. Um, have a hobby outside of football, I think. I think too many people, you know, as we talked about earlier, you know, this this is still just a game, man. It's still just a game. And every one of us coaches, if our knees or our hips or our shoulders would allow it, we'd go play again. You know, I'd play a game again in a minute if I could. You know, you were – this is getting on a tangent here a little bit, but you asked me about Nathan McPeak. In 2007, Gary, I was the quarterback coach of the Huntington Heroes, which was a minor league indoor football team in Huntington, West Virginia. That was in 2006. In 2007, three games into it, Gary comes up to me and goes, if the quarterback doesn't play good this week, you're starting next week. <laughs> I said, Gary, I've not, I've not done this in 15, 15 years. I'm 30, you know, I'm 36. I was 36 years old. You're ready to pull a Jay Gruden. And uh, he said, if he he didn't play good, you're playing next week. And so I ended up playing 10 games of football, indoor football in 2007. And and Nate was my starting right tackle. Wow. But but that just goes back. I love it. You know, it's, it's not who I am. It's just what I do. But I would go do it tomorrow if I could. Uh, I would much rather play a football game than play 18 holes of golf. And I love to golf, but I would rather play a football game. And so, but you, you, you've got to find, you've got to find a happy balance. Um, Make sure you find a good mate. One that, you know, that understands what's going on, what, what this job requires, but keep them in the loop and everything that you do. And if, when situations arise, you know, when you may have to make the move to another place, make sure that, you know, you talk to your mate about that. And it's, and it's a, and it's a decision, you know, when we got, when we got fired from Eastern Kentucky, I was just going to go back and coach high school. You know, I had a, I had a chance to get a, to get a really good high school job there in Lexington, Kentucky. And we were talking about it as a family. My daughter, who was a sophomore in high school at the time, you know, when we got fired, the first thing I did was drive to the high school to tell my daughter because I wanted her to hear it from me. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't want, you know, you know, your dad got fired. I wanted to hear it from me. And so we were talking as a family and talked about what we're going to do. And my daughter said, so this means no more football Saturdays. She goes, no, dad, we go where you go. We go where you go. Uh, we're a college football family, and and we're going to stick in this together and do what and do what you feel is right for this family. And so I think you know once again that says a whole lot about my wife. She's raised them right, but uh, for for the young coach, and like I said, I sometimes I get off on tangents. I guess that's the preacher in me from my daddy. But yeah, I that's think good you, about you podcast. Good work, yeah, you got to find a good uh, work life balance and. And make sure you're doing that. How, how about for you know the high school coach? The high school coach has been doing it 20 years. You know who who are some of your favorite high school coaches that you've gone and visited? I mean, you mentioned George Smith. I mean, I can't believe I got him on this podcast. It was a phone podcast. I put a picture of him up, Coach, because you know I wouldn't expect him to do the the Zoom and all that stuff. I mean, we had a hard enough time with me and you. But who are some of your favorite high school coaches? You know, I've uh, – of course, you know, you did mention George. Uh, I've spent some time talking with Bill Castle, you know, the head coach at Lakeland High School that won a – Coach, I got to get his number because you're the second person that's told me to get him on. Well, we can talk about that afterwards. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. When, when Bill 
Bill was at our rival school when I was at Lakeland, you know. So we there were a couple of, there were a couple of times we didn't see eye to eye when we were coaches. But yeah. I mean he he's won a state championship in five decades. Wow. And, uh, and he's I won one in five different won, decades. Won a, won a state championship in five decades. Yeah, Mike Spencer uh, said, Troy, when you got the pouncies. And what was the running back that went to Florida? They Chris had. Rainey. They had Chris seven Rainey. kids. They had seven kids that went to Florida off that team. He said he had a career against oh, me, against oh, yeah. him Aquinas. And That's what him Mike Spencer George, said. Him and George battled, man. <laughs> him and George battled. Yeah, several, Lakeland several beat him. Lakeland beat him a couple times. Yeah, mm -hmm. Lakeland beat him two a years in times. a row. But um, you know, like I said, Leon Hart was was huge for me and spent a lot of time with him working for him at Eastern and then even, you know, as rivals, you know, we spent a we spent a whole lot of time we spent a whole lot of time talking, you know. I I talked to Kenny Simpson, you know, out there in out there in Arkansas. Uh Kenny and I we talk a little bit. Um and then Gary McPeak, who who we've mentioned his name several times on here. He's you know, he's the I don't know what his title is. He's at Eastern Kentucky right now as the chief of staff or the director. So I don't know what his total title is, but he and I spend a whole lot of time, uh, you know, talking ball. So, but, you know, the guy that's been in it for 20 years, I just, you know, just keep expanding, keep, you know, you know, just, just because you want to run buck sweep 55 times a game, <laughs> that, that doesn't mean that, you know, that you can't line up and throw the ball just a little bit, be a sponge and evolve. Uh, do everything you can kid. I don't think kids today are different. Troy, I think parents are different. Yeah. Uh, it's I my think, fault. But, it's my generation's the, fault. The, I think the, the biggest difference in kids though, kids will still do whatever you ask them to do. They just want to know why, you know, when I played, I just did it because coach Baker or coach Gannon, or my baseball coach, whoever it was, I, or Coach Fott and Coach Donnelly, I just did it because they told me to. I didn't ask why. Run through the wall? Okay, I'll run through the wall. Now the kids will still run through the wall. They just want to know why. You know, and so I think that – I think it's our job now as coaches, we've got to find different ways to motivate. I think we've got to be more transparent than we've ever been, and they just need to know why. They'll still do it. They'll still do it. And – and I think a lot of that has to do with what we mentioned earlier. Some of them, you know, I think it's I think it's very important for an adult male as a head football coach or an assistant coach to put their arm around one of their players and tell them they love them. Because a lot of a lot of young adults aren't being told by another man, you know, the male role model in their life that they love them. And they they want to be loved and they all want to tell the truth. I tell our guys, I'll never lie to you. I'll never lie to you. Now I'm going. If the truth I tell you might make you really mad, but I know if I if I tell you the truth, you'll be mad at me for a couple of days. If I lie to you, you'll be mad at me for the rest of your life, mm. and you know that that's just not worth it. So be a sponge. Keep trying to learn. Don't be so set in your ways and think that there's not a way not to learn. You know I'm still learning. You know I'm still learning, and and you know I I just think you got I think you got to be honest. You got to love. And, and do everything you can to explain to the kids, this is why we're doing this drill. This is why we're getting up at six in the morning and lifting. You know, this is why this is happening. Okay. I don't want to be up at six in the morning to be here with you guys, but this is why we have to do it. So we're going to do it. We're going to make the most of it. And, uh, you know, I, I, I just don't, I don't think that, our job description has changed in a long time. I do think it's evolved. You know, we're still supposed to be doing the same things. We just got to do them a little bit differently. Uh, I think so many times today's coaches aren't empathetic enough with their kids. You know, we don't try to get involved. We don't try to understand. You know, but this this kid right here may not have eaten in three days. Or the food that he's getting from his high school, he's taking home and giving to his brothers and sisters, and he's not eating. And we're getting mad at that kid for not being in the weight room on Saturday morning. You know, we don't have any idea what's going on on those kids' lives, you know, except for when we have them. And we got to do our very best to, to put ourselves in their shoes and try to understand, you know, what they're going through. Even at our level, we've got to do that. 
you know, I had, it, it was uh, 2000, 2017, I believe it was. Uh, I had a kid on my team whose mother was, was terminally ill with cancer. And we knew it was just a matter of time. And I'm sitting in my office one day and knock on the door. And he's a big lineman from Virginia Beach, six foot four, about 310 pounds, maybe even bigger than that, probably bigger than that. But he just knocked on my door. Who is it? And he told me who it was. And I knew what it was by his voice. So he walks in. He's bawling. You know, so I had I got I had three chairs sitting right there in front of my desk. I sat down in the middle chair and he's he's sitting in the one on my right. So I got my right arm around him. His shoulders, you know, his shoulders is uh, I mean, his head is on my shoulder. Tell me, I'm Donovan. I, I understand there's there's not a thing in the world I can do to make you feel better right now. But I understand because I've lost my dad. I get it. Mm-hmm. But I'm going to sit here and let you cry and let you talk. And I'm going to listen. And it wasn't two minutes, Troy, get another knock on my door kid from from the richmond area bursts in my door ball and his dad just got shot and killed mm. so he sits down in another chair so i'm sitting right here six foot four 300 plus in one arm five foot ten 170 in one arm and the other arm two heads on my shoulder just crying and i've got to get these guys back to richmond and virginia beach and it's in april and it's snowing. Mm. And so one of the kids was a Highland Springs kid. So I get in touch with Coach Johnson. You need to talk to Lauren if you can, too. He's a good one. But Lauren says, Coach, if you can get him to Roanoke, if you get him to Roanoke, I'll meet you in Roanoke. So he and one of his coaches get in their car and meet me and my wife in Roanoke at a hotel there. And they pick those kids up. He didn't even know the kid from Virginia Beach. Mm. But he takes the Virginia Beach kid back to Richmond. Somebody from the beach comes and gets that kid. And the coach that Coach Johnson brought with him, his son is now one of my quarterbacks. And I'm a firm believer that one of the reasons we had a chance to get that kid is because of that night. Mm -hmm. Because that dad had a chance to see this is what we're trying to do. This is how we're trying to, you know, to mentor and try to take care of these kids and, you know, what we will try to do. Mrs. Dameron and I loaded them up in a car and we drove in the row in Oak in the snow in April, you know? And so I just, I just think that, I just think that's our job, you know, that that's, that's not in the job description, but, uh, but that, but that's part of it. Yeah. Coach. Well, I love you, man. And I'm so glad that you're the head coach of UVA wise. You've always done it the right way. Handling any kid you've recruited from our school. I'm proud that you're the coach where I graduated and played ball and just keep it rolling, Coach. Is there anything else, Coach, you can think of that we didn't touch on that you want to say to anybody out there listening? I, I mean, no, I'm a – I don't have many words of wisdom. I, you know, I just I just do what I do. We just – we got to just – you know, we got to get this thing going. We got to get this thing going. And, you know, I think we've had good teams. Our records had not shown that. We just haven't been as deep. Last year, depth got us, but, uh, you know, we're going to continue to recruit and we're going to continue to and put competitive teams on the field and try to get there. But I love what you're doing. I, you know, I follow you. I see every one of your tweets. I see every one of Coach McNally's tweets. I follow you, and, and uh, I'm glad you're doing what you're doing. You need to get back here to Southwest Virginia and see us. Next year, you need to bring those kids to the seven-on-seven tournament here in Wise and, and, let, and, yeah. let, them, and let them experience the mountains. Uh Take you over to Robo's and get you a good milkshake. I'm sure you've been to Robo's before. What was that in Big Stone? It's in Pound. It's on. It's it's between Wise and Pound. Yeah, I think so. I think I have. You know, oh, I to come yeah. yeah, if you've been uh, if you've been in Southwest Virginia too long, you've been to Robo's to get a milkshake. I guarantee you that. All right, Coach. I'm I'm gonna press in and we're gonna Facetime Coach McNally, man. Okay, yeah. buddy. Yeah, this gonna be fun. Oh yeah. All right. <laughs>